recording. Okay, so um, the first thing that I want to talk about with you guys, I just want to go over the course outline. All right, so hopefully, here's the course token. Here's my little chat box. There it is. Okay. Um, can can you guys see just through some yeses in the chat box the outline for the lab? Okay, awesome. Sweet. All right, so this lab is not on Wednesday. <laughs> All right, so, yeah. Okay, so this is the um, 11 a.m. to 1220 lab on Tuesday, X12L. Uh, as you will notice on Blackboard, all of the labs have been combined into one section. So the data for the labs, the lab manual, um, information on the quizzes, all that sort of stuff is available through that merge course. The lab component of STAT 151 accounts for 20% of your final grade. So there are five lab quizzes uh, with the dates given um, below. So you can see here on the last page, we have quiz one, quiz two, three, four, and five, and the due dates uh, for those quizzes um, given on the, uh, on the course outline. You have 24 hours to complete each quiz. So the quiz will open on, the, um, on Blackboard. You will access the quiz, and then the idea will be that you use R Commander to complete the questions for each of the different labs, lab quizzes. And you have, um, within that 24-hour period before the due date, you can open the quiz at any time uh, to start working on them. And the quizzes uh, are worth a total of 2% each, right? So five at 2%. And it looks like you, I'll confirm this, but it looks like you have the, that 24 hour period to complete them. Um, I would imagine, I'm gonna check to make sure, I'm gonna just verify the, if there's a time limit when you start the quiz. Um, just so that we're on the same page. Uh, and I'll get back to you guys very shortly on that once I get through this first part. Uh, what time will the quiz open during the day? It opens 24 hours before. So the quizzes are, so for example, the first quiz is due on eight, is due at 8 p.m. on the 29th. So it will open at 8 p.m. on September 28th. Okay. Uh, Rowan, that was for you. Cool. All right, uh, then there is the lab exam. The same idea, so the lab exam uh, opens 8 p.m. on December 7th and is due at 8 p.m. on December 8th, okay? And um, this will be worth 10% of the final grade. The way that the exams and the quizzes work, they're essentially just going to be questions that you complete in R Commander. So you'll have to download or upload, depending on how you want to think about it, a data set from the quiz folder and then you will work with that data set to compute or you know, provide the output that uh, the quiz is asking you for in any of the given circumstances. Uh, otherwise, in addition to the quizzes, the main purpose of the lab is to help you complete the lecture assignments, or let's call them the joint assignments that correspond to both the lecture and to the lab. So an illustration of the first assignment, I'll just give, I'll show you guys um, that. Right now. Okay, so here's our assignments. And then here's assignment one. All right. Okay, so this is the first assignment, which is uh, scheduled for Friday. So every assignment is broken up into two parts part A and part B. Okay. In part A, the expectation is that you do each of the different questions by hand. So you would have, um, 
you would basically be using like a pen and paper approach though. I, I mean, given the circumstances you could use Microsoft Word or Microsoft Excel or whatever, that's very common on the first assignment. Nonetheless, the expectation for part A is that everything is done by hand. So the material that you learn in lecture and from the modules that your instructor may or may not have provided to you on Blackboard, those would be what you would utilize to complete the exercises from part A. So on assignment one, there are two questions in part A, one and question two, obviously, where question two utilizes what is the data that is visualized here. Okay, so for a question two, you're only using what you can see on page two of the assignment. Part B of the assignment is when you would use R Commander, which is what we are going to utilize in the lab. So essentially the lab portion of the course is meant to teach you the materials that you need to complete part B of each assignment from here until the end of the semester. For this particular assignment, we're using the data set m10 underscore salehome.xlsx. So this is an Excel file. So one of the things that we're gonna talk about today is how to upload the Excel file into our commander. Given that file, we then are interested in performing a variety of different, um, or, or in producing different graphs and providing or calculating a number of different summary statistics this sort of thing, all of which can be done using our commander. And I'm gonna show you how to do that in this lab section. Okay, so we have to learn how to upload data. This is going to be crucial throughout the course because every assignment is probably gonna use a different data set or at least we can expect to use more than one data set throughout the semester. So having an idea of how to upload it is, or knowing how to upload is obviously gonna be very helpful to us. And then again, everything in part B of the assignment, that is to be done using our commander. So part A is the traditional lecture approach where we use pen and paper. Part B is the lab portion where we use our commander, which is what we're gonna study in lab. So it's sort of like lab goes with part B, lecture goes with part A. To show you guys how we would accomplish the different tasks on the assignment, we're gonna use the demo data sets. And what we're gonna do is effectively just follow the lab manual through um, or use the information from the lab manual to complete the parts that we need for each of the given weeks. Now again, when I teach the labs, I like to keep it fairly informal because there really is sort of a back and forth question answer style to trying to learn how to use computer programs. But every week, in the course outline, we have a list of the items that we need to work through in that week. Our first week, so this first lab, is the heaviest, in my opinion, for the semester because we need to talk about everything in the first two rows. So we have to talk about getting our, getting our commander, how to upload data, how, how to work with the different data types, though for the most part we'll be working with Excel spreadsheets. And then we have um, computation of the frequency and relative frequency distributions, the different kinds of charts. We have to talk about distinguishing between data, which should be covered in lecture, but I'll go over it again in this section just for clarity. Um, and finally, we'll talk about scatter plots and contingency tables for, um, for this first assignment. <clears throat> the, um, the goal of the lecture in the lab is you know, ideally everything you see in lab, you will have not, you will have already heard about in lecture. Unfortunately, in the first week, we're probably gonna have a little bit of, um, the lab will be slightly ahead of the lecture. At least I know for my lecture session, I'm a little bit behind um, where I should be in the lab at this point, but I'll hopefully be caught up on Thursday. So for the most part going forward, I hope that we will be behind the lecture so that at least the concept isn't being presented to you for the first time once you come to our commander but in this first week we might not all we might that might not be the case and taylor that's awesome so i'm glad that you're ahead um as i said for me personally i know that i'm not i haven't quite finished all of this stuff yet but i'm getting there <laughs> okay so that's the outline again the majority, so there's 100% of your marks, 20% from lab, the remaining 80% is from lecture. 
The assignments that you have in lecture will always have a part A and a part B. Part A is the lecture portion, part B is the lab portion. So part B for every assignment will use R Commander. Nice. Yeah, that's great. Lily's awesome. Um, all right. So let's talk about uh, installing our commander. And Sydney, are you back? Can you hear me? I should have asked that earlier. But... Oh, awesome. Great. Okay. Good, good news. Good news. Um, okay. So any questions on the outline at this point? Okay, awesome. All right, so this is gonna be the most, <laughs> the biggest troubleshooting part. Who has not been able to get our commander working on their machine? Or I don't wanna single anybody out. Let's do it like this. Okay, so today we have to talk about installing our commander. Hopefully you have seen some of the emails that have come through at this point regarding installation of the software. If you have not, and you haven't installed our commander yet, what I would like to do is show you how to access it using Google Chrome or using your browser via the VMware, the virtual machine. The reason why I want to show you how to do this is because it'll be the quickest way for us to streamline getting into the actual um, utilization of the program in today's class. And then once I'm done with the demonstrations, if you haven't gotten it, gotten it installed yet or you've run into an error, send me an email or um, message me privately in the chat. If you look in the chat at the bottom, you can actually select who you send a message to. So you can privately message me if you don't want to message the whole class and just say, yeah, I haven't, I had this error or I need help installing it. And then we can work on that individually um, without having to sort of stop right now and get that all done. Okay, so let's go over how to get on our commander using the virtual machine. For anyone with a Chromebook, this will be how you have to access it. So this will be particularly important for anyone using a Chromebook. If you have a Microsoft or a Mac, uh, laptop or CPU, you can like download this onto the machine directly um, using the instructions that are provided in the core in the lab manual, or I can send you a separate set of instructions again if you are having difficulties with it. For the most part, I will be demonstrating how to use our commander via my actual machine. So I am using a MacBook, so I have R and R commander installed on my um, my MacBook and I'll show you what that looks like after this first thing. Okay, so if we want to use the virtual machine, it's actually pretty straightforward. So we would open up Google Chrome. Where is my Chrome browser? Right here. Okay, can everyone see uh, my browser? It should have this VM horizon thing on the front. Okay. Nicole can see it. So that's good. One person. <laughs> um, all right, so we are gonna go to myapps.mcewen.ca, okay? And I'll just type that into the chat for everyone. Okay. So when we go to myapps.mcewen.ca, we should see this page here, which says VMware Horizon. So effectively what this is gonna let us do is it's going to let us use the R Commander app online. So we're basically kind of streaming it, if you will. All right, so we're gonna click VMware Horizon HTML access. Okay, and now this is gonna ask you um, to log in. So what you're gonna do here is you're gonna type in your username. You don't need to provide the app my McEwen part, that's the default domain. And then you'll type in your personalized password for uh, your McEwen login information. Okay. All right, now, if you're following along on your Chromebook, you should see, or on your machine, you should see 
an app window that looks like this. So you can see that actually McEwen provides us with a lot of different applications that we can utilize um, from home. We have Adobe Reader, which might be helpful to you, to anyone that's using um, PDFs for class. We also have R in R Studio, which are going to be what we utilize here. If you're in other Maple or in, sorry, if you're in other mathematics courses, there's a Maple app shown here. It's good for solving integrals and things like this. Um, many different options. We are gonna use R. So we're gonna click on R and that's gonna load our screen. It should load on our screen. No, one second. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Okay. It worked. Okay. So now what you should see um, is R. So this, this is R. Okay. This is sort of the underlying base R, if you will. We want to use what is called R commander. So in whatever um, system you are using, whether it would be through the VM or the virtual machine, or it would be through R installed on your machine, from this point forward, the commands are exactly the same. So we would type library R CMDR into the machine. We would press enter. And this window here that has just popped up, this is the R commander. Okay, so this here is going to be um, the system that we are using in the lab. So this little display here is going to be what we are going to utilize to perform all of the exercises that we need in part B and to demonstrate what we would have to do to complete part B of our given assignments. Okay. Now, if you are using your machine at home, so if you have R installed on your laptop at home, you can see that the setup is exactly the same. So if you open R, you'll have something that looks like this here. If you type in library CMDR, you get the same window that appears right here. Okay, and you can see that this looks exactly the same as it does on the virtual machine. Okay, so it's just two ways of getting to the same information. Okay, so that is our commander. So this is what we're gonna be utilizing throughout the semester. If you have not been able to get R commander, which is this window shown here on the screen to pop up. Let me know um, either through private chat or through email, and we can work on that once I'm done with the demonstrations. Again, the entire lec or the entire lab session is being recorded, and all of the demonstrations are going to be posted for you on a YouTube channel, so you can watch this after. So if there's something that you miss or I go over too fast or you just want to see again you'll have access to everything we do in lab that you can, and you can utilize it at your leisure. So don't worry if you haven't been able to get our commander uh, working yet, you're not gonna fall behind, okay? All right, now <clears throat> there's one other thing that we need to go over when we're utilizing um, the, the virtual machine. This won't be an issue on our personal laptops. Okay, so if we want to use our commander, which we do, right? Um, we are going to want to be able to pull data into it. And this is gonna be done in the same way, regardless of whether or not we're using the virtual machine or the um, uh, R installed on our computer at home. So we will go to um, data, import data, and then most likely from Excel file. So this is gonna be a consistent process throughout the semester because almost all of the data that we're gonna be working with are gonna be .xlsx, which is an Excel file. If we need to, we can also import from SPSS. There are some .sav files on the course website, but we probably won't have to work with those too often. 
Okay, now, <clears throat> in order for this, um, or the data set that we're going to use today is available in the lab merged section. So if you go into Blackboard, you go to um, the course home for the labs, which is the S151 labs merged um, section. And then you click on the folder, uh, fall 2020 uh, demo data files in XLS. Oh, wait, um, sorry. Which folder is it? Here it is, okay, sorry about that. There's, I get a little lost on here too. So if you go into the lab section on Blackboard, you go to fall 2020 data files for our, our commander lab manual. Okay, so this folder is the folder that contains all the data files that I will use to demonstrate the material from the lab manual. So following in the lab manual, this folder contains the data that's actually utilized in said manual. We are going to utilize eight variable underscore sale home dot xlsx. So what we're going to want to do here is download this onto our machine. So if you click on this particular XLX file, you'll have, you should have a window pop up asking you where you want to save it. This of course you can do, you can save this anywhere. I save it in my lab folder, um, for example, here. So you can see here I have lab data and then I have that eight variable sale home thing. Now, regardless of what type of machine you're working on, you're going to want to download the data because for the virtual machine, we have to download for so that first so that we can import it. And then for everyone else that's not using the virtual machine, we just have to have this saved somewhere on our computer. Okay, so save this somewhere on your machine. If you're using the virtual machine, what we're going to do now is effectively take the data from your computer and put it onto a local drive so that you can pull it into our commander. To do this, <clears throat> we're going to click on this little side tab here. So if you're on the virtual machine, here's my R commander window. Here's R. I'm going to click on this little tabby here so you can see that all of these different application windows pop up. And I'm going to click on this little file transfer tab at the top. So if you see here, you'll have Verizon, you'll have um, this control at delete, and then you'll have this open file transfer panel. So I'm going to click on this and I should have a window that pops up here. Okay. And then I'm going to click upload. So what I'm doing right now, if I am using the virtual machine, so if I have a Chromebook, for example, I would be using the virtual machine. What I need to do is take the file that I want to work with from my computer and put it onto the server so that our commander can find it and upload it into um, the virtual machine. The virtual machine. Okay, so we're gonna click choose files. And again, we're using upload. We want to upload onto the server. Okay, so we're gonna click choose file. The window's gonna pop up. And then I'm just gonna, I'm gonna go to the folder where I saved this eight variable sale home data, and I'm gonna upload this to the virtual machine. Open, okay, so it is now uploaded. I can close this window, close this tab. Um, I'll go back to our commander. All right, so now everyone is gonna be in the same point. Regardless of whether or not you are using our commander on your home machine or you're using it on the virtual machine, everything from this point will be the same. So what we're going to do at this stage is we're going to go, we're going to click data, import data from Excel file. Okay, so again, that was data at the top, import data on the tab from Excel file. All right. So you can see here, 
I have a couple of questions. Enter name of the data set. Okay, well, this is gonna be that eight variable home data. So I'll just give it a name, eight variable underscore home. You might wanna call it something else. You might just wanna call it lab data demo one or demo one or just leave it as data set. It's perfect, it's up to you, whatever you wanna do. You'll see that I have a check mark in this box here. Variable names in first row of spreadsheet. Okay. Um, and convert character data to factors. Missing data indicator empty cell. The big things here, we just want to make sure we have a check mark in variable names in first row. Every data set that we work with in the course, um, or the majority of data sets that we work with in the course, will almost always have the variable name in the first row. Okay, so we want to make sure that we tell R that that first row should not be included as data. Otherwise, we're going to have information that's a bunch of numbers and then a name at the top, and that isn't going to be useful to us. Okay, so then we click OK. Um, well, we should be able to click OK. Okay, let me just try. All right, I guess it doesn't want me to change the name. All right, so then what you'll do, if you're on the virtual machine, you should see your name at the top here. So I see my name, obviously, and then you click on documents, and then that data should be saved in the documents. So on the virtual machine, this is exclusive. Uh, the data should be saved here, and then you can just click open. All right, and then we can click view data sets. Do that. Oh, there it is. And then if we do that, you can see that the view or a view of the data pops up right here. And then we can drag this thing to get a better look at it. Come here. There you go. All right. So this is the data that we'll be working with um, in the demonstrations. Very similar to the data from the assignment, actually. All right. And you can see at the top, we have the name of our um, data of each variable in the data set. We have a number corresponding to the observation value, and then we have all of our information inside the table. So this is the information that we're going to be working with um, today in the lab and learning how to handle, essentially. OK. <clears throat> so whether or not you are on the virtual machine or you are on your computer at home, you should be able to see the same thing. If I'm on my computer at home, the, again, the process here would have been exactly the same. So I would open R Commander. I would go data, import data from Excel file. So you can see that this is the same setup that we had before. Click OK. And then I'm just going to go to the folder that contains my data set. So Dropbox for me, um, QN lecture, this, this, 151. Lab, lab data, this. Okay, and then if I click view, I get the same demonstration here. Okay, so again, what I just wanted to make sure was clear to everyone was that the way our commander itself and the presentation of the data is the same regardless of whether or not you use the virtual machine or if you use the um, uh, your at-home computer. What if it doesn't let me import the file? Uh, what do you mean? Hello. Hey. I, so I typed the name of the file and it doesn't work. Um, okay, so you did. Sorry, I'll go back over here. And you went data, import, from Excel, and then here you type the name? Yeah, I yeah. typed the uh, eight variable, um, and then sale, underscore sale home. Yeah, and then it just pops up again like that, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay, I, I don't know why it does that. Just leave it as data set, and then it seems to let you search. First oh, of all. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. No worries. Give it a simpler name. Yeah, you can try that too. Okay, so we have our data. Um, all right, let's. Yep, 
Yeah. It's a good call. Thank you, Dimitri and Rowan. Yeah, so it seems like if you start it with a number, that actually does is the issue. Um, yeah, thanks, guys. All right, so um, hopefully at this stage, everyone is able, the majority of us are able to see the data. Again, if you're not, if you're still having issues, don't worry about it. We'll be able to solve any of the installation uploading problems uh, once I get through the demos and all of the demonstrations that I do are being recorded so you can watch this through again. So no, we won't have an issue with falling behind or anything like that. Okay, so installation of our commander, importing data. Obviously, the installation of our commander, we only need to do this once in the semester, which is good news for all of us that are involved. Importing data, we'll have to do this for every assignment, for the lab quizzes, et cetera. So we'll want to become comfortable with importing uh, Excel files. Again, this is done by just clicking data, import from Excel, and then we just select on our computer where the data is. Once we have the data, Loaded into our commander, we can click the view data set button here, and that pops up a visualization of the data um, for us to look at. So we can see here our data set is comprised of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight variables and 88 observations. So we have 88 observations and we have eight variables. The variable types are going to be either qualitative or quantitative. And if they are quantitative, they will be discrete or continuous. In this particular data set, we can see pool, which is yes or no, basically indicating whether or not the house has a pool. That is a qualitative data set or a qualitative variable. It's qualitative because it is a label. It is not a number and it is indicating whether or not the house does or does not have a pool. Roof is also qualitative. It's indicating whether or not the roof of the house is a tile or a non-tile roof. So we have two qualitative variables, um, pool and roof. All right, if we want to <clears throat> utilize or work with the qualitative variables, we have a couple of options. First, we can go to um, statistics. Oh, sorry, one sec. I just need to refer to the manual real quick on this one. So if we wanna work with the qualitative data, we have a, a couple of different options that we can work with. First, what we can do are, is build the, um, frequency and relative frequency distributions. And then what we can do is we can summarize that information using um, bar charts or pie charts. So as you have hopefully seen in lecture at this point, but if you haven't yet, I'll just again go over. The, um, <clears throat> the qualitative variables in a data set, so that is the variables that are not numeric. They're most often labels. So again, here we have pool and roof as our two qualitative types. Those data can be summarized through frequency and relative frequency distributions, and then through uh, pie charts or bar charts. So those are the common tools that are utilized for qualitative data. If we want to look at the frequency and relative frequency distribution for either pool or roof, we can do that by going to statistics, summaries, frequency distributions. Okay, so again, if we want to use our commander to compute the frequency or relative frequency distribution, we will go statistics, summaries, frequency distributions. And then we can select the variable or the variables that we want to see. So if we pick one variable at a time, say pool, and we click okay, you can see that the frequency distribution and the relative frequency or percentage in this case distributions pop up below. If we wanted to do that for roof, we would do summaries, frequency distributions, we would select roof, and then we can have this pop up below 
And this is the same idea. So here's our frequency distribution. And here is our percentage or relative frequency distribution. And then if we wanted to be a little bit more efficient and save time, we could probably do both uh, together. So if we select both variables here, click OK, it pops out information for both. OK? So <clears throat> for our, um, our qualitative data, we can compute the frequency and the relative frequency distribution simply by clicking statistics, summaries, oops, sorry, summaries, and then selecting frequency distribution. And then we pick the qualitative variable that we are interested in. Notably, when we do this, our commander only gives us the option of those two qualitative variables anyways. So our commander knows which variables are quantitative and which variables are qualitative. So it is defined, um, in this case, roof and pool as being the qualitative values. If we want to produce visualizations of these variables, so for example, a pie, a pie chart or a bar chart, we would click on graphs and then we would simply select bar graph or pie chart. So if we select bar graph and then we pick pool, for instance, okay, we can then customize the graph for pool inside the options tab. So again, what I've done here is I went graph, bar graph, and then I selected pool just for illustration, but we could do this for either pool or roof. Again, you can see that R knows which variables are qualitative. So it is automatically, or it is only allowing us to select either pool or roof because we are using a bar graph, which is, um, specifically utilized for qualitative data. Options. Okay, so here we have access, axis scaling, so counts or percentages. The bar graph will look the same regardless of whether or not we use the percentage or the count. The only difference is gonna be what is labeled on the y-axis. So if we were to pick counts, this means that the y-axis is going to be whole number values and the height of each bar will go to that number corresponding to the frequency distribution. Our axis label is going to be um, the, uh, is basically just going to be yes or no, depending on whether or not the house has a pool. So we could label this, ax this axis as like um, pool, well, let's say, house with pool, okay? And then above that, we will have yes or no. So house with pool, and then we'll have either yes or no. The y-axis is going to be the number of houses that either have or do not have a pool. So this is just going to be number of houses. And then the axis will show us a count of how many of those houses either do or do not have a pool. And then finally, the, um, the graph title, in this case, we can just say bar chart of number of homes with or without a pool, for example. So we want to give it the chart a title that describes what we are looking at. So when I see the plot, I should know exactly what it is the, the plot is displaying based off of the title. Below, I have show counts or percentages in bars. So this is just a, an extra feature that you can customize depending on how you want to visualize your graph. If you wanna see the percentage or the count, you can keep it checked. If you just want to see the bar without any number associated, you can uncheck it. Um, color selection, default or from the palette, up to you. Uh, style of group bars, divided or side by side. Again, up to you. It's the same information. It's just giving you a little bit of customization within the plot. So what I suggest is you just sort of, you try to build the bar chart. Um, you try and build a few different bar charts just by selecting different options to see what you like and what is available within the program. Uh, percentages for group bars, conditional or total. Position of legend, above plot, right, center, left. 
Okay, so the legend is just gonna tell us which bar corresponds to which type, and we can place that wherever we want. All right, so if we click OK, this will produce a bar chart that looks like this. All right. So you can see the default coloring is just the gray scheme. If you click color palette, that'll probably add a little bit of color to the plot. Our x-axis label, house with pool, no, yes. So we have 18 houses that do not have a pool. We have 70 houses that do have a pool. On the y-axis, we have number of houses. Again, the bar for no is lining up with 18 on the y-axis. So the bar is going to the height of the y-axis. The bar with um, yes is lining up at 70 because there are 70 houses there. And then we have bar chart of number of houses with or without a pool as my title. So again, so I know exactly what it is that I'm looking at. If I want to save this, I can right click on the plot. Oh, sorry. If I want to save this on a MacBook, I can go file, save as and then I can select where I want to save that plot. And this can be useful for extraction into the assignment submission, but we can talk about that um, a bit later. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh. All right, now, to build a pie chart, same idea, graphs, pie chart in this case, we can select the variable, so let's do pool again. Now, with pie charts, we're probably going to want to see a little bit of color, so we can use from color, uh, from color palette. With pie charts, we're almost always going to use percentages in the segment labels, because with a pie chart, the idea is that you have a circle whose total area is one, and then you're slicing the circle into separate sections that correspond to the percentage they take up. So in this particular, or in almost any illustration, it's, it would be strange to have counts within the pie charts. We're almost going to always, we're almost going to exclusively want to stick with labels in this particular case, or with percentages, sorry. With pie charts, we don't need any axes. Um, they're not utilized because the pie, it's understood that the area of the pie is one and that each slice is a, is a specific percentage. So we don't need to label the X or the Y axis for a pie graph. And then for the title, we'll just want to say something like pie chart of homes with or without a pool. Okay, and we click OK, and we get something that looks like this. Oh, no, sorry. Like that. Okay. So, Pie chart of homes with or without a pool. It's saying 20% of them do not have a pool, 80% yes. How do I access the charts when I make them? Um, what, what do you mean access the chart? Nothing comes. Um, Oh yeah, it should it should just pop up. Um, figure margins too large error when okaying any graph generating messages column. What kind of machine are you using, Taylor? Okay, so sometimes when the image pops up on a MacBook, it gets hidden behind other windows. Yeah, so if you click, um, depending on your machine, you might have like an F3 button. It's a button that shows like the little window icons. If you press that, it should um, kind of show you all the windows on your screen and then you can find the plot from there. Alternatively, yeah, so the other thing you can try Yeah, yeah, so the, the graph will pop up sep separately. So the other thing you can try is in R, you can click window at the top and then click on the little Quartz 2 logo and that might also bring the, um, 
the, the window to the front. Otherwise, I'll try and help you with this after. It should be the case that the window is there. It's just being kind of hidden behind the other icons. And Kayla, um, I'll have to take a look at yours after as well. Um, I just haven't seen the Windows one in a while, but it should be a similar solution. So if we open our <clears throat> on a Windows machine. Okay, and then we go, yeah, if we click Windows, you might be able to, from that Windows command, find the plot and then just bring it to the front. Oh, nice. I guess Rowan, you're gonna be my assistant through the lab. Cool. Um, okay, so for qualitative data, so any label, any data that appears as a label we're gonna, we can use the frequency distribution or the relative frequency distribution. And then for each individual data or each individual variable, we can build the, the bar chart or the pie chart. So again, qualitative data, we have our frequency and relative frequency distributions for the labels. And then we have bar charts or pie charts. If we want to visualize the, um, qualitative data to qualitative variables at the same time, we can use what is called a contingency table. So in R, if we go to statistics, contingency table, two-way table, we can pick the two variables that we want to visualize at the same time. So the two-way contingency table is utilized to compare two qualitative variables together. So here, we only have two qualitative variables in our data set, which are pool and roof. If we click OK, oh, oh, sorry. So we only have two qualitative variables in our data set. We want to put one of them on the row of the table and the other one on the column of the table. It doesn't matter what order you do this in. Uh, so let's say that we put pool on the row and roof on the column and we click OK. We get something that looks like this. Shown at the bottom here. OK, so this is the two way contingency table or the frequency table for the two qualitative variables that are in our data set. What this table is showing us is how many of the observations are non tile houses that have no pool. How many of the observations are tile houses that have no pool? Yeah, Caitlin, everything will be uploaded. Yeah, sorry about the technical issues. Um, but once uh, this is done, I'll render and post the video and I'll send you a link to it. Did you get that? Awesome, cool. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, right, so the frequency table is giving us counts that are comparing the different categories within the table. So if I wanted to, what I could use is the um, frequency table to compute different percentages of how often each of these different categories are occurring. Okay. Sweet. Good to hear, Taylor. All right. So in this contingency table, I have 11 homes that have no pool and are non-tile. I have seven homes that are no pool and have tile. I have 52 homes that have a pool but are non-tile roof. And I have 18 homes that have a pool but are um, tile roof. So if I wanted to compute, for example, the percentage of homes that do not have a pool and have non-tile roofs, I could type into R 11 divided by 88, which is the total sample size. And that gives me 0 0.125. So that's the percentage of homes that have a non-tile roof and no pool. All right. So I could do similar things for the other entries in the contingency table. Say, for example, I wanted to know 
how many houses have a pool and have a non-tile roof? So there are 52 houses that have a pool and a non-tile roof. That is a proportion of 0.591. So 59.1% approximately, or approximately 59.1% of the houses have a pool and a non-tile roof. Now I can also do things like compute the percentages of all the houses with a pool, but I could do that using um, the frequency distributions given above. That information is simply repeated here. So for example, if I took 52 plus 18, that gives me 70. That's just telling me all the houses with a pool. So you can see that the two-way contingency table is in some sense a, um, a, um, a breakdown of each of the frequency distributions given above. So we're, we're taking this information from the frequency distributions and we're further subdividing it so that we can see how the categories compare. All right, so that is my, my qualitative data summary. If I want to produce graphs for qualitative data, I would have bar charts and pie charts. If I want to just look at the counts for qualitative data individually for each variable, I would have my frequency and relative frequency distributions. If I want to compare two types of qualitative data, I would have my two-way contingency table. And again, in general, everything is accessed through the statistics command. So summaries, frequency distributions, statistics, contingency tables, two-way, and then the graphs command. And in the um, lab manual, which is shown here, we are working in uh, section 2.2. Okay, so we're going through right now different elements of section 2.2. So loading data, and now we're talking about um, summarizing qualitative data in particular. Okay, so the video of this will be posted after in section 2.2 from the lab manual is where we are going to um, focus or what we are working through today. Okay, so the next thing we have to talk about are histograms and scatter plots. So when we have quantitative data, we can still summarize that information using um, our commander. But for quantitative data, we are gonna have a slightly different set of tools um, than compared to what we had for the qualitative values. Okay. So for quantitative, in our data set, we have one, two, three, four, five, six quantitative variables. So we have size, area, age, bath, stories, and price. Now, some of these variables are quantitative discrete and some of these variables are quantitative continuous. For example, the variable area would be quantitative continuous because we have a decimal point associated with the value and because the area can be measured to some level of precision. That is, it exists on the continuous scale. Variables like stories and bath would be quantitative discrete because they are counting features of the homes. So they are not numbers that exist on a continuous scale they are really labels that are more qualitative than they are quantitative. So in some sense, we can think of a quantitative discrete variable as being a qualitative value, but it takes on a whole number count. So, or, or it, it's represented as a number or a numeric value, but it, it has a meaning that is similar to qualitative data. So Bath, is just counting the number of bathrooms in a particular home. So two and a half bathrooms. So two full bathrooms and a half bathroom. Three, three full bathrooms. Uh, three and a half, three full bathrooms and a half bathroom, et cetera. 
stories is just counting the number of stories on the house, right? So we have a number of one story homes and we have some two story homes. So really we can distinguish between, or we can use stories in the same way we use roof or pool. Because in this case, we would just be having counts of the number of values that exist as either one, or the number of homes that are either one or two stories. Now, if we wanted to visualize this information, because it appears as a quantitative value, we would go graphs, and then we would go to um, histogram. So the histogram is sort of like the uh, quantitative bar chart, if you will. So for qualitative data, we have our bar chart. As we saw before, it's just giving us bars to a height for each of the different labels. For quantitative data, we have a histogram. It's gonna be very similar to the bar chart, except that the bars are connected to one another to represent flow of data, if you will. Well, in lecture, you'll probably talk more about this idea. Okay, so now we can pick, let's look at a histogram for bath, for example. We can click options. So on the x-axis, we would have number of baths. On the y-axis, we would have number of homes. And on the, for the graph title, we would have histogram of homes of number of baths in each home for sale. Okay, click OK. And then, ah, here is my histogram. Okay, so you can see that actually, in this case, R has done a good job of somewhat being able to kind of separate um, between the data types. So you can see what's happening here is the, the bars are being placed right over top of the half point numbers, and then the bars are slightly to the left of the whole group numbers. So with the histogram, what we are seeing here is an example of what's called binning. The truth is it would be better if we could actually use uh, baths as a qualitative variable. So there might be a way that we are able to um, go back and fix this, but this is something that I'll have to explore a little bit afterwards. But in the point is that I'm trying to make is the qualitative variables in the data set are very obvious, right? Like we have um, pool and we have roof, but a variable like bath, really should be treated as qualitative as well, or at least as quantitative discrete, because each of those values is really a label that's describing a feature of the house. A variable that's better suited for a histogram would be something like area or price. So if we go graphs, and then we go to histogram, and then we pick, let's do area for illustration, and then we go options, so we would have here, um, area of home. On the y-axis, we will still have number of homes. And then we'll have histogram of area of each home for sale. And we click OK. Now what we can see is something that looks more like what we would expect a histogram to look like. So we have these connected bars representing the bins. So in this particular illustration, we have homes between 8,000 and 10,000 in area, homes between 10,000 and 12,000 in area, homes between 12,000 and 14,000, 14,000, 16,000, et cetera. And then we have a count of how many homes fit into each of those groups. So here we have roughly 25 homes that are between 8,000 and 10,000. So the bar height represents the count of the number of homes that fit into that particular bin. All right, um, <clears throat> or okay, and then here we would have roughly, let's say about eight, seven to eight homes that are between 12,000 and 14,000. So the idea with the histogram is very similar to what we had for the bar chart. The y-axis here can be either number, uh, a count of how many observations adhere to a particular characteristic, or it can be a percentage, same with the bar chart. But with the histogram, we are binning data 
based off of what um, based off of bins that we create and how many observations fall into each of those labels. So with the histogram or with quantitative continuous data, we are actually creating um, what we can think of as labels for the data points. So, so many data points should fall into this particular bin in order to be um, counted in the graph, if that makes sense. It automatically created them. Yeah. Yeah. And it doesn't look like we have any control over that. Even in the lab manual, it seems to be the same. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, what other things? Let me just take a quick look here. Scatter plot contingency table. Okay, so we're getting closer to, to getting most of the material out of the way. Let's um, take a look at some of the other things that we can do with histograms just for, um, just, just for our knowledge. There's some customize, our commander gives us some ability to customize our plots. So if we go to graph histogram, okay, and then let's say that we select area again. When we click plot by group, what this is going to do, let's say that we select pool. This is gonna create two separate histograms now. So what we've done in this case is we've built a histogram for all the houses that have a pool, which is on the bottom here. So this lower plot, these are only the, house, the 70 homes that have pools. So the total height of each bar, if we were to add all of these together, that would be 70. Whereas in the top part, when we have pool equals no, the total height of each bar should only add to 18 because there's only 18 homes without a pool, and, but there's 70 homes with a pool. Okay, so we've just separated the data into two groups based off of whether or not they do or do not have a pool. Um, <clears throat> okay. If I wanted to um, create a histogram for another kind of variable that's also quantitative, so we could go to the graphs, scatter plots. Oh no, sorry, histogram. And then we could do, let's say, size or price. Um, I hope it doesn't plot it by pool now. Reset. There we go. Okay, so let's say that we do price, click apply, cool. Okay, and now we have a histogram for price. So hopefully you guys are, are sort of are tracking this and you know noticing that once we have the data imported, building the plots and building the distributions and the, the contingency table anyways is all very is pretty straightforward. You know, we just we use our graph command and then we select the um, the, the, very, the, the plot that we are interested in, and then we just give it a little bit of customization in terms of axes, and then we can separate by groups and things like this. The last type of plot that I wanted to show you guys how to work with was the, um, the scatter plot. So <clears throat> when we want to compare two quantitative continuous variables at the same time, that's when we would use a scatter plot. So the histogram and uh, the box plot, which we haven't talked about today. No, we'll do that next week. So the histogram and the box plot and the box plot are for one quantitative variable. When we want to look at two quantitative variables at the same time, we would use a scatter plot. So we would go graph scatter plot. Let's do that again. Graphs scatter plot. And then what we would do is we would just select the variables that we want to compare. So maybe we want to compare area and price, or maybe better yet, let's compare size and price. Okay, so let's see if there's a relationship between the price of the house and the size of the house. Okay, and then we go to options. So our X variable is going to be size. So our label axis here will be size. Our Y axis will be, um, price and then our graph title will be sale price versus size of the house 
Okay, you can see that we have a number of options here, plotting characters, for example, let's just keep that as automatic um, and let R scale it accordingly. So once we have our X and Y axis labels put in, we click OK. And here's our plot. All right, now, what we can see here, and this will be important for the last part of assignment two. How do you know which will be X? Yeah, good question. So if we go back to um, graphs and then we click on scatter plot, you can see here it says, uh, I can't highlight it, but it says X variable, pick one. So I pick size and then it says Y variable. Yeah, and then from that, you can label accordingly. Cool. All right, okay, so here's my resulting scatter plot. <clears throat> All right, now, on part B, we, are, we will be asked to describe the scatter plot. So what does it mean to describe a scatter plot? For right now, what we want to talk about is the idea of trend. So what we can notice here is that size is, as size is increasing, the price of the object is also increasing. What we would say in that case is that we observe that as the size of the house goes up, the price also goes up. Let me see if I can, sh if there's an example in here or something that's decreasing just so that we have a bit of context. Um, I'm just going to create a second scatter plot of Doesn't look very good. Um, okay. I'm going to show you what I mean by increasing and decreasing in a different way. I just need to make some fake data up. All right. So here's our original plot. Okay. So I mentioned before that what we are seeing here is an increasing trend. So as one variable is getting bigger, the other variable is getting bigger. Illustrations of this um, can be done in the following way. Okay. So I'm just going to make up some data now so that I can show you guys what I mean. No, nothing that I'm doing now you need to know how to do. I just want to try and give you a better illustration of what increasing and decreasing trend looks like. So this is all just example. None of this is, is uh, needed at any point. Okay. So this is what I mean by increasing linear trend. So you can see that as X goes from zero to 100, the Y value is also going up. So this is an illustration of increasing trend. Decreasing trend would be something like this. Okay, so here, what we can see is that X, as X is getting bigger, the Y value is going down. So this would be what we call decreasing trend. So as X gets bigger, Y gets smaller. So the trend is always described as how does Y change positively or negatively with an increase in X? So X always has to get bigger and then, we and then we decide if Y is getting smaller or larger. So this is decreasing trend. The previous plot, which was this one, was increasing trend. Okay, and then this plot here would be what we call no trend. Okay, so this is what we call zero trend. This is just randomness. As X is getting bigger, Y is not doing anything. It's just like all over the place. Okay, so this would be no trend. If we go back to the, um, the histogram that we were working with, no, sorry, not the histogram, the scatter plot. 
<laughs> okay. Now, when I say that there's an increasing trend, hopefully you can see there's a little bit of context, right? So as size is going up, price is always is also going up. Okay, so that's what I mean by an increasing trend. We have positivity in price as X gets bigger. If this was decreasing, we would basically just have like a flip of it where the highest portion would be up here. And then as X gets bigger, the graph would come down here. Okay. Hopefully that made sense. Oh, and then finally, if there was no trend at all, as size gets larger, you would just have blue points randomly scattered all over the plot in many different locations. Okay, so that would be no trend. Um, Rowan, yeah, so the, actually our, com <laughs> our commander is a really good starting tool, which is why we're showing it to you guys now. But when I use R, I never use R commander. I, I hard code, which is what I was doing in the console. You have way more flexibility that way. We won't talk about that in 151. If you're interested, at some point I can show you some stuff with it. Um, but you will see it if you if you continue on in statistics in third year and in some second year courses, we use R traditionally, if you will, without the commander. Okay. Um, exactly. Yeah. It's a, it's not even just for stats. It's, it's a programming language. You can use it for anything like I have friends that build like little walking animations in our like little dudes that well walk. <laughs> uh, okay. So it's just about three minutes to the end. As I said, this is probably going to be the, the lab section where I do the most talking. Um, I apologize, you know, if we didn't get a lot of time to work on stuff. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop the teaching part now. So this is all the material that we needed to cover in the first week and that we need for the first assignment. I'll hang around in the Zoom chat room after. So if you guys have questions and stuff about whatever it is, like getting plots or anything that we talked about, we can go over that. And um, I'll, I'll render and post this video and send all of you a link once it's ready, which will probably be, you know, no later than the end of today. Okay, so I hope that was helpful. Um, thanks for everyone that gave assistance in the chat uh, with the Zoom and the um, R Commander stuff. And um, we meet every week in the same Zoom room at the same time. So the next time we'll have our lab section is next Tuesday at 11. And it'll be the same setup as today, but we won't have quite as much stuff to go through. So we should have more time to work on things one-on-one -on -one or as a, as a group. All right. So thanks, everybody. I hope that was helpful. And um, as I said, I'll stick around. So if there's any questions, please let me know. Otherwise, feel free to send me emails. Um, this is, if you can't find my email, I'll put it into the chat. And, um, if you have any questions about the assignments or the, or interpretation or producing plots, like feel free to send me screenshots or PDFs of what you've made and I can help navigate through that. Okay. All right. So take care everybody. And, uh, I'll see you next week if you don't feel like sticking around. No worries. Yep, Rebecca, I'm here.